All right, we've got almost 50 folks here. I can start with just some, some updates and logistics before we get into the real thing. Um, so yeah, first off, hello DER Task Force. Thank you for joining us for another session. Uh, we're really excited about this one. First, we're just gonna get into some boring stuff though, get that out of the way. Uh, so a few things, one, I, I highlight this every meetup, but if you are in the community and you're working on something cool, whether it's a startup or maybe you're an academic and you're doing some really neat research, or maybe you just built a project that's really great, or even just something you're thinking about that you'd like to expose the community to and get feedback on, um, we do community showcases. So uh, when someone has something interesting like that, then they wanna show off a little bit or get feedback, uh, we will reserve 15 minutes in the beginning of the meetup for them to present and just give us a taste of what they're doing. So if that's something that interests you, if, you know, if you're working on something that could be a good fit for that, you know, please get in touch with us. The Slack, email, Twitter, like any any of our mediums, send us a note and let us know what it is uh, and we can get you signed up for the next meetup. We've had a few folks do it so far and it's been really cool. Um, and I think what we're gonna do with them is, come. all of these are recorded, so we'll compile them into a big community showcase and release that at the end of the year. Uh, so, you know, you and a few others, um, you know, would be in that video and released to the podcast so, so people could learn what you're up to. Um, secondly, then we just launched a newsletter um, that we're really excited about. Our newest team member, Sophia, who's on the meetup today, Sophia, give everybody a wave, um, <laughs> is, is running that. Um, if you got our first, um, our first instance of it last month, at the end of last month, we, we'd love to hear your feedback. What we're trying to do there is, you know, highlight what people are doing, um, bring to the surface interesting conversations that are happening in the Slack, uh, have a little fun with just interesting little things that the community is sharing, uh, such, as, uh, such as last month, um, Carl Lennox built a little swamp cooler when it was hot at his house and controlled it with an IoT device. So that was our uh, dur of the month. Um, but, you know, all sorts of cool little things like that, in addition to just announcing meetups, sharing recordings, things like that. Um, if you signed up on our website previously, you're already in the newsletter. Um, if you want to be in the newsletter, sign up on our website um, and you'll, you'll automatically be put into that. Related is we're going to be launching a new website this month. Uh, we've said that a few times before, but we really mean it this time. Um, and it has a bunch of cool new stuff. There's going to be a big resources guide, a featured member list, a streamlined sign up process, a bunch of other neat stuff, in addition to hopefully just also better, uh, better describing to the world, you know, what it is we do and what this community is about. Um, so we'll be launching that this month. We'll, you know, send it out into as an email blast to everyone. We would really love your feedback because uh, it was a bunch of work to get this together, but we're really interested in doing more work as well to make sure it's the best thing it can be. Another than small thing, just logistics on how these meetups work if you haven't been a part of one before. Um, first of all, this is being recorded. So um, not that we have a massive audience, but we will be posting this to our YouTube and possibly the podcast and other, other channels. So if a recording is something that maybe makes you uncomfortable, just turn off your microphone, uh, turn off your camera and, and just observe. Um, but if you're okay with that, we'd love for you to participate and turn on your camera and be willing to talk because uh, it just makes these, these meetups a lot more fun when you can see everybody you're talking to and get to know your community members. Additionally, um, during the presentation, just please keep your microphone on mute. Uh, things can get a little hectic. Otherwise, you should be on mute automatically, but if not, uh, please do that. Now, the, the sort of schedule for this is our, our guest is going to give a brief presentation on their topic, uh, probably 20 minutes or so. And then we're just going to launch into community Q&A, and that usually eats up most of the time and is, is the, the most fun part. <laughs> Not that the presentation won't be great, but the, the Q&A is where we really get to, uh, get to test our guests and uh, you know, just make it interesting. Um, if during the presentation you have a question, please just put it into the chat. And 
once the presentation's over and it's Q&A time, we'll actually call on you uh, and you can come up to our virtual stage and ask your guest your question, ask our guest your question yourself. Um, if you're not comfortable with that though, just let us know and, and I'll, I, I, can, I can ask the question. Um, and the same goes during the Q&A. If we're, if we're sort of deep into one thing and it triggers some other question you have, just put it in the chat and we'll make sure you get called on. So, so that's it on updates and logistics. Um, so I wanna just quickly introduce our guests today. We're extremely excited about this meetup. This is gonna be a really cool one. And we're lucky enough to have Michael Murray of uh, the president of Mission Data. Now Mission Data is a really interesting organization that is working to uh, address the, the critical nature of giving customers access to their utility data. And that sounds simple, but it's not. It's, it's really a fundamental requirement of where our energy system is going, but it's often overlooked and under-resourced. And Mission Data works to fix that. Um, so Michael's gonna give us a brief presentation on, on what it is they do and you know, the nature of their work. And I think he'll also touch on some kind of hot topics that are happening right at this moment that I think our community is gonna be really interested in. So with that, Michael, if you could introduce yourself and kick off your presentation. Great, thank you so much. Um, let me know if you have any issues hearing me. Um, once in a while, this microphone will drop in volume, but I, I think it's good for now. Uh, and I'll sh yeah, start, start sharing my screen. Um, as Duncan said, it, this will probably be 20 minutes and, and um, I'm also really looking forward to uh, some, some greater discussion. So um, just on a, Personal note: I was. Uh, we were talking about this before the before many of you joined. Um, uh, I live in Washington State, um, born and raised in the American West, and things are pretty rough right now with wildfires and wildfire smoke. Um, I'm actually uh, evacuated the town where I live due to the the smoke being really bad. And so, um, when we talk about climate change and distributed resources and how these things are going to you know decarbonize the power grid, um, it it feels a lot more real to me when, you know, I could see a wall of flames uh, from a, a burning fire not too far from my house. Uh, and so this, I think, just gives me some extra urgency to, to work on these issues. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy to be uh, talking to some like-minded uh, people this evening. Uh, I'm going to talk about three different things. Um, first, some background on mission data. Um, second, some, some new information about smart meters that um, everyone who works in this space should, should become aware of. And then the last uh, point is um, I'd like to present a historical lens um, through which I think we should be seeing this competitive tension between DERs and monopoly utilities. You can see my screen? Okay. Great. So uh, Mission Data is it's a small nonprofit organization. Uh, myself um, and a couple of co-founders began it. Um, it's been eight years. Uh, it's a long time. And it came from this recognition uh, that so many DERs just absolutely struggle with getting customer data from the utility with the customer's permission. So my background was I was a co-founder and CEO of Lucid, an energy management startup company for commercial buildings. Uh, if you remember, there was this sort of euphoria around smart meters in the 2007, 2010 timeframe. Um, we sort of naively went to some of those early utilities and said, hey, we have customers in your territory. We don't want to install additional meters that cost a lot of money and require site visits and sometimes building shutoffs in commercial office buildings, for example. So where's your API? Let's do this. You know, you're getting billions of dollars to install these things, either from taxpayers from the Recovery Act or from ratepayer dollars. And we think you should provide an API to us. And you know, the response that we got was sort of confused befuddlement. Um, you know everything from, well, we don't do that sort of thing to if you really want the usage information, you should ask for PDF copies of the bill. Um, and I just remember being really frustrated by that. Um, I didn't know anything about utilities or how uh, public utility commissions worked, what their role was, what their history was. Um, I was sort of a, you know, fresh out of university, um, just sort of assumed, you know, all this stuff had been figured out and was hunky-dory and 
surely if the California utilities where I was living at the time got $5 billion in ratepayer funds, they would have thought about this. Um, and then I came to realize it's actually a lot more complicated than that. And uh, this started to take up a lot of my time as the CEO of Lucid. Uh, long story short, I transitioned out of that role. Um, we started this organization to be very focused on this issue because quite simply, no one else was working on it. Um, we do occasionally work with other organizations uh, from time to time to you know, help uh, broaden the reach and our advocacy at different public utility commissions. But um, uh, there's sort of a, an overlap of you know, technical software background coupled with um, you know, policy work that, um, that we sort of have, have found a niche in. Um, and so we have about 30 member companies. Um, we, uh, as I said, we're, we're a nonprofit. We work in about 12 states um, any year, in, in any given year. And um, the green button there that you see at the bottom, um, that uh, refers to green button connect my data. Uh, that's an API that you've probably heard about. We can talk about that. And um, we've been involved in uh, these five states that have mandated uh, uh, the implementation of Green Button Connect My Data for about 36 million meters nationwide. Um, our goal, this is a bit lofty, but it's nonetheless uh, something that we work on continuously, is zero marginal cost, consistent access to uh, energy data with customer permission, regardless of what zip code you live in. So we have uh, 3,500 retail electric utilities in the U.S., roughly, depending on how you count it. Um, so it's a, big, it's a big task. But if you are developing DERs that want to scale into a national market, you need a lot of consistency. And it just really pains me to see entrepreneurs with really great ideas um, having to spend and, frankly, waste a lot of time on just stupid data issues and instead of focusing on really building the product and delivering value. So that's kind of the niche that we try to fulfill. And some of the um, points that I make later on this evening uh, are written about in a recent report um, that you can find on our website. So feel free to check that out. <clears throat> so uh, quickly, this is how this would, would work. Um, imagine you're sitting at home on your iPad and you're wondering, how can I save on my bill? Uh, you know, what options are available to me, you know, from me, maybe I've heard about a neighbor that does heat pumps, or I've heard about this or that technology, what are my options? Um, you could uh, simply share your energy usage, potentially maybe cost information at the click of a button. And that information would be transferred automatically from the utility to, let's say, your iPad app, um, where it could give you, for example, um, an analysis of your 15 minute or 60 minute usage data, um, sort it by, you know, different financial paybacks, um, give you some really tailored information that, that takes advantage of cloud computing. So you're not looking at national average, you know, what's the average person going to save? You're actually looking at your specific house with your specific uh, usage histories. Um, and this is all, you know, not new technology. Um, a lot of these technologies have been around for a really long time, at least in the internet age, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, but if, Utilities have been very, very, very reluctant to get with the program, um, and that's that's you know one of the things we're going to talk about is the the reasons why for that. So let me take you back to smart meters 1.0, and I think it's important to understand a little bit about that before I tell you about version 2.0. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, version 1.0 was um, there was sort of this techno optimism um, that was really quite pervasive at the time. And the notion was that smart meters were going to, you know, magically open up these huge technological opportunities for integration with, you know, behind the meter resources of various types. And so you saw this, you know, lofty rhetoric from utility executives. Um, the whole industry was sort of infected, frankly, with this, uh, this optimism, which, you know, as it turned out, um, was largely, I, I think, a failure by, by many metrics, just to, to be honest. And the, <clears throat> there was, you know, public money was put into this um, through the Recovery Act. Um, we have about 100 million or so smart meters deployed nationwide. Um, but according to a recent study by ACEEE, um, 49 out of 50 utilities that they um, studied were not actually using uh, all of the capabilities of AMI. There was only one out of 50 utilities that was actually doing all the things with AMI that they said they were going to do. And so the sort of cynical, um, if not inaccurate response to that is, you know, utilities, meaning investor owned, were driven by the money. 
they wanted the CapEx. And as soon as they got that investment, all other considerations about extracting more value, doing the right things by customers, helping customers access their data or share it, all of those were secondary or tertiary concerns. They really just wanted the money. And there's a, this you know, has been a wave of resistance around um, on the part of utilities with sharing this, this information, e even when the customer is you know, begging the utility to, to do that. So a lot of people have smart meter fatigue. Um, you're probably tired of hearing about it. I'm tired of talking about it, um, to be honest, but I think it's worth another look. And let, let me tell you why. And this is because there's a new version of smart meters that is going to be deployed nationwide. We're looking at back of the envelope numbers, uh, something like 10 million of these deployed by mid 2025 and potentially 54 million or more by the end of the decade. And the, so the big fundamental change is that the smart meters now run Linux. They come with a computer on board and they also come with Wi-Fi. And this opens up a huge number of possibilities, um, but also some very significant anti-competitive risks, which, which we'll talk about. So whereas on the left is sort of a traditional smart meter, uh, you can access that uh, that usage data, if you're the customer, generally speaking, you know, 15 minutes, maybe hourly. Um, the applications for that, for energy analysis, are, are, are many, but one of the key ones, disaggregation, is actually really difficult. So the signal-to-noise ratio just isn't quite there to get device-level recommendations. But if you have a software application running on the meter that's sampling voltage, power, and current thousands of times a second, you could potentially get very, very accurate disaggregations um, for the first time at zero marginal cost. And so that's a really transformative uh, change in, in this potential. Whereas with Smart Meter 1.0, you know, it's kind of a coin toss, like, oh, you know, we think we can roughly identify your HVAC usage or your heating or your cooling usage in your home. Um, over longer time periods, it's, it's more accurate. Um, but you're just not going to be able to say, you know, oh, this is exactly what your water heater is using. <clears throat> Excuse me. But with Smart Meter 2.0, you could potentially identify like, hey, your living room lights are on right now. And that information could be transmitted out via Wi-Fi uh, on a real-time basis, serving all sorts of distributed energy applications. So this is really a seismic change. This is the largest change in smart meters that I've been aware of in my career. So you know, since the advent of the first rollouts of AMI in 2005, 2007, this is really the biggest thing to, to hit the industry. Um, according to some utilities, these meters are now, uh, have reached cost parity with traditional version 1.0 smart meters. So we would reasonably expect these to be installed anytime there's an AMI deployment. Um, and keep in mind that there are many states whose uh, AMI systems are getting old and will need to be replaced. So big states like California, Texas, Pennsylvania, those states will be uh, uh, renewing, you know, refreshing their AMI deployments um, by the end of the decade. And that will add tens of millions more of these onto the grid. So it's very exciting. Uh, some of you who, you know, are sort of energy data and nerds uh, may know some of the, the DISAG field, uh, also known as NILM. It's a terrible acronym for non-intrusive load monitoring. Um, this is one of the uh, you know, Keystone paper is done in the 90s um, that looked at different analytical approaches. And, you know, uh, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but essentially that the higher frequency data on power that you can, uh, you can measure, the more accurate your both identification and quantification of those loads will be. So this is a, a really significant, uh, significant development. But, and there's a big but. The fundamental question is about fair competition. So uh, these meters, uh, according to some of the manufacturers, have an app store. You could load different apps to run on the meter. There's two gigabytes of memory, you know, go have at it. That sounds great. But who gets to write an app? How is the Wi-Fi capability going to work? Who is accredited or eligible to receive that data? And what are the terms and conditions that are going to apply? Those are really serious uh, business questions. And I think it's really important as a community that we look at these not through the lens of just purely a technical issue or purely an issue of uh, you know, moving from centralized power generation to distributed endpoints on the grid, 
Um, but we need to look at this as, as one of competition and, and, and what are sort of principles of fair competition that could apply here. So, so let me give you an example of some of the risks. So let's say there's Acme Electric, uh, a, a utility company. They can uh, build their own smartphone app. Maybe it's tied into their billing application where you, where you pay your bill. And they can communicate with your meter over Wi-Fi using a protocol called IEEE 2030.5. That's fine, that's great. You could get real-time information on your phone. But chances are this app is made by the utility and therefore the technology is not gonna be very good. Let's be honest. Uh, those of you who you know, entrepreneurs and innovators in this space are gonna come up with much more engaging and interesting ways of processing this data, connecting it to home energy management systems, with voice assistants, whatever. So what type of access are those entities going to have, right? And there's a big question mark around this. Um, utilities are deploying these already by the millions with some fundamental questions going unanswered. What are the conditions under which these different entities can access this information? Um, will the utility say, oh, there's a, there's a cybersecurity problem. You know, you're not allowed to get access to any of this information until you complete some unknown cybersecurity test, right? Are they going to require that you um, get, you know, become a regulated entity under the Public Utility Commission or Public Service Commission in your state. Um, these are big issues, and but ratepayers are already on the hook in many states for paying for this technology. And so one of the things that really gets me up every morning is I don't want to make the same mistake with this version two of smart meters that we did with version one, which is we didn't think about this stuff and we basically lost, you know, eight or 10 years um, with, with widespread accessibility. So these are some of the key, um, key risks that, that we're working on today. So the, I mentioned there's a historical lens that I think we should increasingly be looking at these dynamics through, and that is the lens of antitrust. So uh, America has a rich tradition of antitrust uh, laws and enforcement going back to the first Gilded Age. And I wanted to mention one uh, Supreme Court case in particular that I think is interesting and uh, is sort of a way of framing this discussion. Um, this is, it was a, a case called Cantor versus Detroit Edison. Uh, Mr. Cantor was a, a drugstore owner um, in, in the Detroit Edison service territory. And Detroit Edison had um, this very successful light bulb program. So essentially this is in the, the 1970s. So they offered free, high energy using light bulbs uh, for exchange everywhere. And the drugstore owner was upset because he wanted to charge in his store for light bulbs. And he was being undercut by the utility who was offering it all for free. Uh, the case uh, went to the Supreme Court and um, eventually the court ruled in Cantor's favor. And so just a couple of details on this, I think are, are important. Um, the utility rate payers we're paying for all of these light bulbs, right? It wasn't just the benevolence of Detroit Edison shareholders where this money came from. There were some 18 million free light bulbs given out in 1972. Um, these were high energy, you know, 100, 150 watt light bulbs. And the court determined that essentially that this, uh, what Detroit Edison was doing was they were juicing their own revenues and profits. And they were making the whole captive uh, public pay for it all. And it was took the Cantor case to sort of bring this to light. Um, so uh, the, the picture you see is of Justice Harry Blackman. Uh, you may know him as the uh, author, uh, the, the, the majority decision on Roe versus Wade on abortion. So he's a very uh, important Supreme Court justice. And I wanna just read a couple of quotes uh, from this case because um, it bears a lot of resemblance to, um, to, to some of the tensions between DERs and utilities today. So first of all, he said, uh, quote, the light bulb tie-in, and this is referring to the fact that, you know, customers are sort of forced to pay for these free light bulbs. Um, the, the light bulb tie-in presents the usual dangers of such a scheme, principally that respondent, Detroit Edison, will extend its monopoly from the sale of electric power into that of light bulbs, not because it sells better light bulbs, but because its light bulbs are the ones customers must pay for if they are to have light at all, right? So it's addressing this, this 
uh, th this sort of tension at the root of it, which is the, the forced subsidization of, of these light bulbs that, that hurt um, independent businesses, right? And, and he went on to say, and this is a, uh, a conclusion that, that the court um, upheld. He said, quote, the fact that anti-competitive conduct is sanctioned or even required by state law, meaning the Michigan Public Service Commission approved of this uh, program, does not in itself put such conduct beyond the reach of the Sherman Antitrust Act. So that, that's, a, that's a big conclusion. What this is saying is that the fact that a utility is regulated by a public service commission does not grant infinite immunity to prosecution under the antitrust laws, right? And they're both um, civil and criminal uh, offenses that are defined in, in federal law. So there's a, a really rich history uh, of antitrust enforcement in the US. We need to go back a century or so in order to look into it. But as we think about these um, increasingly competitive tensions between DERs and utilities, um, this is a really interesting uh, uh, frame of reference um, and one that frankly calls into question the legitimacy of a lot of behind the meter activities that um, utilities are engaged with today. So um, I'm gonna end with this. I think it's really important to have a sober look at the nature of the relationship between uh, DERs and utilities. And for a lot, I've known so many entrepreneurs over the years that have either, you know, gotten sort of sucked into the utility black hole where they just exclusively served utilities and they had a very hard time functioning as independent businesses just serving customers. And so that relationship can be very fraught. And um, some of the principles from, uh, from you know, fair competition or the antitrust history that we have in the US um, can be summed up as follows. When Amazon claims to have a marketplace of third-party sellers, but then itself starts selling its own products through that marketplace, that is a conflict of interest. When Zillow provides a real estate website and information to buyers and sellers, but then Zillow itself starts buying and selling real estate, using the advantage that it has, that's a conflict of interest. Similarly, when a utility has a state granted monopoly over the creation of energy data, and they begin marketing their own products and services uh, around that and, and marketing them to the ca their captive customer service base, um, that's a conflict of interest. And so state public utility commissions, um, if they're doing their job effectively, need to be aware of these tensions. And this is something that um, I think many commissions do not realize that they are in fact the tip of the spear uh, on antitrust enforcement in the U.S. You shouldn't have to file a federal lawsuit um, to make utilities do the right thing. The commissions uh, should frankly do a better job um, at defining some of these boundary lines between the competitive market and the monopoly side of things. So um, I'll leave it there and um, really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Really Super intriguing. Um, this slide is awesome. <laughs> um, so maybe we'll we'll kick it off with some of the questions that are in the chat. It always ends up generating more. Um, so I expect a bunch more to come out. But I think there's maybe a, a high level one here that will help everybody understand this a bit better. Um, Heather Payne, you had, you had a question about kind of what the fundamental issue is here. Uh, do you want to jump up and ask it? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so I think one of my main questions when I think about this data is the fact that we have a situation where utilities are really claiming ownership of it. And yet, if we look at that data, I'm a law professor, um, from a legal perspective, there's a really good argument that customers should actually be owning that data instead, right? They're actually generating the data through their usage. So there's an argument to be made that the utilities are not creating that data. The individual customers are actually creating that data. And of course, as you've already noted, all of the meters have already been paid for through rate base. And so it doesn't, it, it shouldn't, be that utilities should be able to get additional revenue streams um, for access to that data because 
the underlying systems have already been paid for through rate base. So where do you think that that fundamental disconnect for regulators, is that really the core of our problem in this space? Do we need to have a much more of a focus on having regulators say that ownership of this data is with the customers and not with the utility and stop like the New York um, docket right now, just talking about access, which in my mind is just going to be insufficient long-term. Uh, I love that question. Um, I think yes and no. Um, <clears throat> to my knowledge, Texas is the only state to have passed a law that says that usage data belongs to the customer. Um, it doesn't refer to cost data or payment history or that type of thing, but just the usage data in the meters. Um, that is very helpful in general. I tend to think, yes, it, it, it belongs to the customer. The customer owns it. Um, they paid for it. And, you know, I'm happy to concede that there's some, you know, grid, um, grid facing uh, information for, you know, distribution resource planning and that type of thing that, that, you know, you might think of as, as the utilities or, you know, I hate, hesitate to even call it proprietary information of the utility because it's like, you know, anyway, I'm skeptical of proprietary rights from utilities in general, but um, where the ownership question uh, to me is, is sort of insufficient is that while at a high level, I think it's, it's accurate and yes, more commissions need to declare that customers own it. Um, there actually was a New York ruling on this recently that, that sort of offhand said, oh yeah, by the way, it belongs to the customer. Um, I'd, I'd like to see more <laughs> detail around that added over time, certainly, but where it can be a problem is um, it sort of can be a distraction because um, the more that we talk about ownership, we validate the inherent idea that it can be owned and we sort of muddy the water a little bit on access rights. So, um, you know, even a state like California, which is relatively forward thinking on this, has not made a determination of ownership. They've, they've shied away from it um, a little bit cowardly in my mind. But it, if you focus more on who has the right to access it and when, um, I think that that's sort of the root of the matter anyway that needs to be discussed. So just because I own it doesn't mean I can, you know, effectively use it or have it shared with other people. Just look at HIPAA, right? So HIPAA says that um, healthcare data, like you own your healthcare data, but there are tons of companies in the space that are having a hell of a time um, uh, accessing uh, customers' health records from other, uh, you know, clinics and hospital networks and so forth. So just the declaration of the ownership right doesn't, isn't itself sufficient. I, I would call it perhaps necessary, but not sufficient. Hey, Michael, just quickly, you want you mind unsharing the screen so we can we can get the, the big view here and uh, unless you have more slides to share. No, that's it. Cool. Well, I'll follow that up then with it's it's actually a question of mine that James helped clarify. Um, and please Kind of, I, I might get this somewhat wrong, but my understanding is like in the UK, for example, it's neither the retailer nor the utility that installs the meter and owns the meter. It's a third party. Um, one, is that the case? And, and two, are there, are there benefits of such a system with regard to data access slash ownership? Um, or does it, you know, does that third party really have an interest then in locking that down and claiming it's proprietary? Yeah, I think data monopolies can form anywhere. Um, I used to work in with building automation systems and boy, you wanna talk about data monopolies, Siemens and Honeywell and Johnson Controls, they think it's all theirs. And I'm like, didn't the customer pay you hundreds of thousands of dollars for the system? And in, now it's like a gotcha thing where you don't want the information to come out. So um, it's, it's definitely a problem regardless of the, the circumstance. I don't think it's, you know, the tendency toward data monopolization is, is unique to the utilities in any way. Um, I can't really- Look at the big platforms, right? What's that? Like Facebook and stuff as well. I mean, it's all over the place. Sure, right. Yeah, um, yeah, Facebook is sort of your classic data monopoly. Um, 
I can't speak to the UK. I don't know uh, all the details about that. Um, I do know that in general, they, they view it, they're more committed to markets in the way that Texas is. And so there, I think there's just a general belief in data portability. Um, the United States is the only Western democracy that does not have a national data portability framework for health data, energy data, banking data, you name it. We are totally behind the times. Um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, um, uh, South Korea, Western Europe, I mean, they, they all have, they're all working on these things. And we're sort of woefully behind. Um, you know, it's like, if you have European friends, they're like, oh, you know, we can do like instant payments, you know, between our banks, like it's super easy. Like Americans have to do wire transfers and you have to like enter your bank's username and password into some fintech app to get your budgeting information. It's, it's like insanity, right? It's the wild west. Um, and our government's been totally asleep at the wheel on that front. So um, I, I, again, I think ownership is, is a key thing that needs to be talked about, but it's not the only thing. Um, and and that, that's certainly been the experience with health data. Um, there's a lot of um, HIPAA violations because um, hospital networks are kind of like monopolies and they're hoarding a lot of the information. They're not letting others access it, which could get them, you know, could potentially lead to lower prescription drug prices and things like that. Interesting. Um, so, okay, now they're really starting to roll in. Um, maybe it's worth thinking about what the, the sort of like counter arguments here on, on privacy and things like that. Um, David Schmidt, I'm just, since your question was really straightforward, I'm just going to kind of summarize it here. Like, what are the privacy concerns or issues with this kind of like V2 of smart meters? What, what, what is the argument being made around this? So uh, several of you uh, are probably, if you've worked on this, you're probably like sighing with me too, because it's like, oh, privacy. We have to have another conversation about privacy. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've yet to hear of like any actual harm that's occurred from, you know, some inadvertent disclosure of, of, of energy data. Um, I think it's a bit ridiculous that, you know, I was fighting with a lot of these issues, like at the same time that the Edward Snowden revelations about the intelligence community, like hacking every single, you know, large company and, and telco. Um, and it was like, we were, we were just fighting totally different battles. Like the NSA got everything they wanted. And, uh, you know, we were like pulling teeth just to get access to energy data. So anyway, we have some very displaced or uh, misplaced notions of, of privacy concern, but, but putting that aside, um, you know, I do care about privacy. Um, Mission Data has and will always advocate for permission-based exchanges of information. Um, the issue that the utilities say, um, once you sort of peel the layers back, is not one of privacy concern, but one of liability. So they're concerned that if I share my data with Acme Energy, and Acme Energy then has a breach of some sort, and I'm harmed in some way, that I am gonna get an aggressive lawyer and I'm gonna sue the utility. And that's, that's really where the, the rubber hits the road. I, you know, I'm sure they care somewhat about privacy, but it's sort of in this condescending paternalistic way, like we need to retain the monopoly over the entire universe, lest there be one instance where something terrible happens with one person's energy data we can never let that happen. But in you underlying it, it's it's the money. They're worried about liability, um, and some states have passed uh, rules or enacted laws to say that you know once the data is shared with a third party, uh, it's not the utility's responsibility. They have no liability for that anymore, um, and that has been incredibly helpful in getting past these uh, these arguments about privacy. So when, when that liability is removed, you, you've seen utilities um, discomfort with, with, with more free data access uh, be reduced? Yeah. And, it, you know, I sort of get this sort of um, uh, two-faced response. You know, on one hand, it's like, oh, we're, we're so liable. We're so liable. We could never share the information. And then I mean, I've had these discussions with utilities where it's like, well, let's just stipulate that you're not liable for it and let's just make it go away. And then some of the utilities come back and they say, 
actually, we don't want to do that because then we lose control. So we want infinite liability for all privacy breaches. This is the utility speaking. We want infinite liability. Pile on the liability. Give us more because that way we have control over the ecosystem. And that's just not fair, right? That, that you know, I do think customers have the right to share their information in an informed way. Um, and that shouldn't be the utilities concern. Um, so anyway, I, you know, for all the talk about minimizing liability that utilities give us, um, it is a bit hypocritical, I think, when they turn around and say, oh, we're infinitely liable and nothing can ever change that. Okay, I see. So sometimes kind of used as, as cover as opposed to maybe a sort of sincere issue. Um, Sierra, I, I think you had a really important question here that also kind of frames the conversation broadly. Do you want to jump up? Hi, I'm Sierra Peterson. Um, I've worn many hats throughout market-driven approaches to decarbonization, not least of which I actually worked at the California Public Utilities Commission uh, many years ago. Um, and uh, I'm now investing in early stage climate tech startups. Question for you specifically, what gives you optimism that you know, despite AMI 2.0 tech being better, utilities are gonna think from a different playbook and not blocking access? Oh, I, I think they're gonna to continue to block access, um, but I think we're a lot smarter about it this time. Um, the, the rose colored glasses have been taken off. Um, you don't see this sort of irrational exuberance, particularly with Silicon Valley investors um, who like in 2008 threw money at anything related to clean tech and networking, right? Where they thought there was some magical synergy. And then all of those companies either, you know, they either went belly up or they became a utility vendor or they just like left the space entirely and did something else, um, you know, with like O-Power being a notable exception. Um, so I do think another thing that's happening is um, you see a lot of litigation important litigation on the, in the antitrust sphere. There's this you know, resurgence of antitrust. Um, Biden's appointment uh, as the uh, Federal Trade Commission chair, Lena Khan, um, sort of signals a shift in, in how the administration thinks about concentrated economic power. And so um, like I would look really closely at the um, Epic Games lawsuits against Google and Apple. Um, very, very important. If you read that and instead of uh, hearing Google and Apple, you, you just plug in your local utilities, your friendly investor-owned utility. A lot of the dynamics are similar, right? Very similar. Um, utilities and the meter manufacturers are talking about app stores on meters. And so if there are antitrust violations uh, with you know, consumer mobile apps, like shouldn't there be antitrust liability on smart meters, which you've you know, coerced every customer into buying whether they like it or not because they're a captive customer base. So, I just think that we have, a, we have more tools in our toolbox now. Um, and at least, I mean, for myself, I think I'm, um, I'm, I'm no longer naive about this. Um, I, I was very naive <laughs> eight years ago. And I just thought, oh, you know, it, this is all just good faith argument. Like the utilities are really trying to do the right thing. They're not trying to be obstructionist. And it's like, no, it, it, it's, it's often just a bad faith attempt to slow things down. Um, and so I think take, having a realistic uh, a mindset of the dynamics here and that we can't wait like five years or 10 years in some stakeholder group to like, you know, have a kumbaya and figure it out. I, th I think that helps us. So in, in specific terms, do you see this happening though at the federal level or state by state? What's the ground game here? I mean, and how do you see this market actually opening up? Um, uh, I think all of the above. Um, several states have introduced uh, bills that would um, ban um, the commission fees on app stores. So that's an interesting trend. Um, I know that a lot of for the DERs on the line, like you don't want to be paying 30% of all of your revenue to a meter manufacturer who happened to get a contract with your local utility, right? That's, we call that extortion, right? Um, so I think those state laws are important. Um, federally, yeah, I think antitrust enforcement with the reinvigorated um, Department of Justice Antitrust Division and, um, and FTC is going to be important. Um, and of course, there's even, you know, federal legislation looking at, um, you know, looking at things like app stores and stuff like that. So 
Um, uh, you know, I generally I deal with state regulatory proceedings, so I can't opine too much on you know the legislative uh, sphere. But um, I just think there's uh, there's a lot of movement in these areas as people have more maturity about the um, you know course of contracts, right? Um, where data monopolies can you know hold certain things over the heads of uh, different companies. What I really don't want to see is I don't want to see the DER market go the same way as banking. That's a cautionary tale. Um, banking startups, you, you ask for the customer's username and password to their, their bank accounts. And if you're lucky and you cut a sweetheart deal with a big bank, and then maybe they'll give you an API. Like Intuit, you know, cut a deal with Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan. Like, do you think a five-person startup working out of a garage can cut a deal for API access with Jamie Dimon? No, of course not. It's all about who has money and wealth and power and how do you use that to get what you want from a business perspective. And so what I'm always working for, looking for is like a level playing field, right? Like let's win on merit rather than who has money, who has connections, who has a secret deal with the utility where I can get access to this or that piece of information. Like let's have a common standardized API so that if you meet, you know, objectively knowable criteria for cybersecurity or privacy protections or whatever, you can get the same information as, you know, some other large corporation. That's, that's what I'm really working for. You know, maybe related to that, I'm going to combine two questions from Dave Erickson and Sean Grimes. I think they were wondering, like, is there a path around the regulatory process here, right? The, the, the utility meter produces this data and it's owned by the utility, et cetera. Um, but presumably something else could produce this meter too, some maybe very cheap AMI metering thing, or maybe it's just built into all of our devices or, or whatever it may be. Like, is there some future where this is just less important or even if you can produce that data and make it useful to third parties, you know, the utility meter is like the official record, right? By which one gets billed, et cetera. Um, I don't know. Can you just dig into that a little bit? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had the, the great fortune to go to Australia a couple of years ago before the pandemic and, you know, talking to them about this, um, there's a great company called um, Watt Watchers and they're doing a lot of uh, submetering with solar installations, you know, something like one in four households has solar in Australia. And um, there isn't very much smart metering. And so they're kind of like in a position of like being the source of truth, um, just a private company that just happened to install metering with, you know, solar rooftop solar installs. And so that makes a lot, it makes a lot of sense. It makes sense that that's going to be more useful in terms of like duck curve issues when, you know, your baseline is just once a month, you know, meter readings. <laughs> um, in the US, however, you know, we're approaching near ubiquity of, of AMI. And as you say, the, the smart meter is the source of truth. Um, there are certainly wholesale markets where you can install your own metering equipment and you have to meet, you know, rigorous, you know, sort of anti-fraud, um, uh, you know, accuracy requirements so that you're not lying and, you know, trying to, you know, juice your, your um, curtailment numbers in a DR market, for example. But um, I, I don't know in the U.S. that there's any way to go around it. I think we have to go through it. Um, and that's because the, the VEE process, validation, editing, and estimation, is such a, such a big, hairy deal that um, getting a final bill is really important. Getting those final official numbers is so important that a lot of um, ISOs and RTOs won't accept anything but that. So um, I, I sympathize with the urge to make new devices that bypass the utility because, you know, we need to work on a time scale that's not glacial. I believe me, I, I did a whole business bypassing utility for 10 years. Like I feel that. Um, but one of the reasons why I'm working on mission data now and why I feel it's important is because for valuing DER services, we're always going to have to come back to the utility meter. And if you try to provide your own data, the utility is going to pour endless resources into discrediting you, saying it's fraudulent, saying you don't meet the same accuracy requirements, and so on and so forth. And that's just a battle I don't think we want to fight. So, Duncan, can we, and, and Michael, can we stay on this point for a second? Because I think it brings up two 
really interesting points that I was hoping to, to get to at some point tonight, Michael. One is that we're obviously, you know, working on together now, just as like a, a tangible example for people. Um, in New York utilities, you know, a lot of them paid for uh, meters that have a Zigbee connection to, uh, you know, they, they paid for the extra little device in there that can communicate via Zigbee. Uh, but the utility, because of cybersecurity concerns, require companies like ourselves to get a utility to roll out a truck, build a new demarcation box, which costs $750. And then we would have to install a gateway to pick up that box, and which costs $800 plus our time. So we're talking 1500 to 2K instead of a $100 device that the customer can just plug into the wall and pick up the utility, the, the meter signal through Zigbee uh, for, in, and then you're done. So it, it basically, when you look at a smaller commercial customer, residential customer, completely squashes the economics of anything you want to do with a DER or demand charge management or DR or arbitrage, all these, all these things, right? Um, and, uh, um, you know, just, just to get access to the smart meter data. It's like 20 times what it, what it should be. Um, and so there's, there's two sort of interlocking pieces here, Michael, that you just started to get at. Um, what's shocking to me is that it seems like no one's even brought up this issue in New York, right? Like the, the meters were rolled out. No one's even asked to, to use the Zig. Like they, when we asked them, they're like, why? I don't even know what you're talking about, right? And so the first question is, how do we... Um, you know, I'd love if there was a hundred Michael Murray's out there, right? But we're we're blessed with with only one. So, you know, you have to go utility by utility to just say, hey, this all this infrastructure is here. We can use it. That you've made the arguments in California and Colorado and all these places in one, but they just the argument just hasn't been made in in certain certain jurisdictions. And then, so the second piece of this is is not just access to the data, but then forcing the markets to use the data. Like at the ISO level, we've rolled out all these smart meters, but still residential um, customers say in New York do not settle to that financial data. Meaning if we had a, um, a residential customer with a battery and we realized prices were high in the ISO, uh, you know, they went to $4,000 per megawatt hour a couple of weeks ago, which is crazy in New York. If you discharge the battery when they were high, that would lower the demand curve for that customer. However, and, and you can see that through the smart meter, but the utility, um, the utility gives us a load curve, the retailer that the market financially settles to. So it's basically that benefit of discharging that battery is aggregated across all residential customer class that the utility has created. So it's, it's one, it's the access to the data which seems like, at least at this point, it's a, it's a function of just making the argument and over time you will win because you've shown us that you can win and that the arguments are obvious. So we just need to do that at scale. So the first question is, is how do we do that at scale? And then the second question is, it feels like the question on settling to the meter, like we're so far behind on the data access piece that we haven't even, you know, I don't even know where we're making that argument or if we can make that argument at the PS, PUC or the ISO, like, how do we wrest that control of financial settlement out of the um, hands of the utility? So, so, you know, I just, before we moved on, I wanted to, to cover those two pieces, which I think are very much related to, to what you were just, you were just speaking to. Yeah. And it's, it's such a good reminder that, um, that public utility commissions are not doing their jobs when they're forcing customers to, pay for this capability in meters one estimate is a five dollars per meter that they can never use they already um, well they already paid for it and they got to pay for it again right so it's, well exactly you know yeah. it's, it's it's the oh whoops excuse it's the oh well you know well now you're asking oh now you want well hmm you know that's going to be a you know that's going to be a new application a new cost recovery and so you know we can basically get the public to pay for the fact you know our mistake for not thinking about this the first time around and, and the utility and, and the regulators let it happen right like that they're they're asleep at the wheel a lot of the time um so i anyway several things um that can be done about that um one is you know we are a membership organization so shameless plug please email me i want more members the more we have the stronger the more states we can cover and you know this advocacy is really important um 
Number two. I will two, say it's the, it's the best money you can spend is becoming a member of Mission Data because if you can hire more people, then hopefully you can get those hundred Michael Murrays out there to unlock all of this in all these states. Yeah, thank you. Um, and it's, I, I guess what gives me a, a bit of optimism now, um, I, I'm cautiously using the word optimism, um, is a couple of things, but the fact that um, utilities often, you know, are kind of like sheep and they do what other utilities do. And so it's just becoming more uh, normal to provide access to customer data, to the you know, third-party access. Um, it's not as big of a hurdle as it was eight years ago. Um, is it happening fast enough? No. Is it still a fight? Yes. Is that a pain in the ass? Yes. Um, but I, it's the, the steepness of the uphill climb is not quite as bad. And that, that gives me some hope. I think, um, you know, it's up to a lot of companies here to reach out to public utility commissions. This is a lot of what, you know, what I do all, all the time is just make them aware of it. Many of them have absolutely no idea, right? They're like, what customers paid for that and they can't use it. And, they, and they're upset by it, right? Like it resonates. It's their job to do something about it. So many times I'm, you know, I was telling a friend earlier today, I was like, I'm basically doing the government's job for them. Um, it's frustrating. Like mission data shouldn't have to exist, you know? Um, it, it should just happen by default. Um, but that's, you know, you, then you get into like, oh, captured institutions and political corruption and, you know, all the rest of it. So it, like, make no mistake, it, it's a battle. It's going to be a battle. Um, access to data and who controls the data will be contested territory for a very, very long time. Um, but I think it's, I think we have, uh, you know, the, the ethics are really behind us. Like it's the customers to do with what they want. Utilities are stewards of that information. They need to make it happen. If, if the customer says, I want you to share my data with this entity, who are they to question that, you know? And that resonates with people, but we got to work through some of the nitty gritty details around privacy, around security, around liability, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get there. Yeah, and that's, so um, just to follow up on, on the second uh, point, that, that covers the first one, but can you briefly touch on settling to the meter and like where we are? Because it even seems like we're so far off in so many markets uh, on that, like Texas being the only one to my knowledge where, where it actually happens. Um, so is that at the PUC level? Is it the, the ISO level? Can FERC, can 2222 can actually force this? Like, is that something we can get through at the federal level or, um, cause that's like the, what we do with the data once we have it question, right? So how, how, how much further off is that piece of it? Yeah. Um, so I am not a FERC expert. Um, I don't, don't, you know, practice in front of FERC. Um, I do think, I do think it is as we approach near u ubiquity of, uh, smart meters that it sort of just becomes, you know, more and more outrageous that, um, you know, RTOs are not settling <laughs> based on that information. Um, but the, the sort of political or advocacy approach to success um, with each RTO is going to be somewhat unique. It's a little bit of like a state by state approach for dealing with PUCs. Um, you know, they have sort of their own dynamics, they have their own, you know, voting and accountability measures. Um, you know, you could argue that, you know, they're sort of um, you know, capture and a lot of the rules are built around supporting existing generators and discriminating against DERs. And that's another reason why they don't want to settle on the meter. In addition to sort of technological, you know, a lot of RTOs don't want to raise their costs um, for various reasons. So um, I don't have a great answer to that, but this is something that I hope this group can, um, can help like energize um, because it is really just a crazy market failure um, that there isn't you know, settling to the meter that's happening, particularly with, you know, 2222. So I'm sure there's other people on this call that are probably more equipped to answer that question. What I'm hearing is it's the ISO and RTOs where that pressure can be applied and, and FERC has jurisdiction there. So it's, it's maybe better than the case here where you have to go utility by utility, hopefully. That's, that's great. All right, so an interesting one here, um, our favorite Carl Lennox had some thoughts on a historical grand bargain that was proposed. Um, Carl, do you wanna explain this and, and ask if, you know, uh, 
what Mike thinks of it? Sure. Yeah. So um, many years ago when I was directly involved in such things, um, there was a lot of discussion over the fact that you know, utilities are, were only getting kind of net uh, load data from the meters and DR providers, uh, solar providers mainly at the time, storage wasn't really a thing yet, had the other half of the puzzle, if you will, and were actually typically acquiring that data at far higher resolution uh, than the utility. Um, and so there was kind of this idea of like, well, you know, utilities are making really, really hard for us to get customer data. Uh, the DR providers were not very interested in giving utilities access to um, their data for, for the data they, they were uh, uh, stewarding, uh, if you will, for various reasons. And so what, maybe, there's a, maybe there's a deal to be struck here. Maybe like, there's a carrot um, uh, that, that didn't end up working out. Um, but uh, I just yeah, thought it would be useful to maybe chat about why it didn't work out and, and, and how, that might, how that might help us inform, you know, uh, what we do here going forward. Yeah, um, I'm imagining, maybe this is a bad analogy, but I'm imagining sort of like a prisoner's dilemma situation of like, do I cut a deal? Do I not cut a deal? <laughs> like, should I just wait? <laughs> and, um, you know, whenever there's a potentially risky business decision involved from a utility, I think 99 times out of 100, they're going to choose just wait. Um, you know, maybe they think their data will become more valuable over time and other people's will be less valuable. I don't know. Um, so I think their, their threshold uh, for decision making is, is going to be very different than the industries. Um, you know, they're just the, all the incentives are different. Um, I do think there's something to that. Um, one of my fears, however, um, which I alluded to in regards to banking, is that there would be a deal, a one-off secret deal cut between individual companies and utilities that's not sort of more open access. Um, and so if you look at Tesla, um, you know, back when Solar City filed their antitrust lawsuit against Salt River Project um, because of, you know, extremely high solar fees that would have, you know, that made their market activity drop 96%. Um, Solar City won in district court on an antitrust basis suing SRP. Um, for some procedural reasons, it went up to the Supreme Court and the day before the Supreme Court ruled, they settled. Well, what was part of the settlement? SRP agreed to buy a bunch of batteries from Tesla. So I don't, I mean, no offense to Tesla, I love Tesla, but like, they, they were narrowly concerned with their economic interests. They were not interested in establishing a precedent for good public policy, right? Um, again, I totally love Tesla. I understand why they made the decision that they did. But there, so there's a new lawsuit, like a, a class action amongst um, people with solar that's trying to push this up through the courts and, you know, that's not going to end in some sort of, um, you know, secret settlement agreement. And that I think could be really, that could potentially set, be, be a sort of model for the type of grand bargain that you're talking about. Um, obviously, you know, it, it, so it, it's a complex issue, but I have the sense that these, what my fear is that we have secretive one-off deals that get done and it's not a sort of a, a level playing field, right? Like I, if someone, if there's a DER, that has really good behind the meter information, I feel like they should in good faith, you know, be able to go to a sheet, like a commission approved, uh, a government approved sheet that says, if you provide this information, you will get in exchange your customer's information this way. And it's a bilateral, you know, it's like a tariff and it just, it goes together and these are the rules behind it. Um, I'd really like to see something like that. Yeah, it makes sense. I think one of the things that happened too, I alluded to this in my comments is that uh, to your point about slow rolling, I think one of the things that happened is it got kind of slow rolled, and then the utilities were able to make the argument that, well, you know, we really need this data for operational purposes, for safety and reliability. We need to know where where generation is happening and when it's happening, and they actually got rolled into interconnection requirements, even though, it's, to my knowledge, they're not actually. I mean, it's, they're just the smart meter uh, requirements, which, to my knowledge, I don't know if they're actually even using the data, to be honest. Um, but they are ostensibly or theoretically uh, able to get access to it. Through that, through that, through that path. Yeah. So I think it's a, I think it's a cautionary tale. Yeah, and and keep in mind you have some states where the public utility commission 
does have jurisdiction over behind the meter companies and some where they do not. And so that creates all sort of issues like maybe state, you know, maybe in order to have sort of effective, uh, you know, uh, reciprocal data sharing between DERs and utilities, maybe you do need commission oversight and then state legislatures are going to have to enable that authority that, that currently doesn't exist in many places. Great, thank you. Hey, so we, we've talked a lot about problems, <laughs> which seems to dominate this discussion. Um, a Fisher, I'm, I'm not sure who you are, but if you want to ask your question about good examples. Sorry, I was scrambling for mute here. Um, hi, Michael. Hey, Alex. <laughs> How's it going? Good. How are you? Thanks. Not bad. Um, I had asked, I think we kind of discussed it earlier about like ultra, like if there are any art, I think I was specifically thinking about the U.S., um, if there are any alternatives to the utility being the metering, like having pr having purview over metering, if the regulator has done it, if a municipality or a state has decided that this is in their purview, and I know, and I'm I'm I work in the state energy office in DC, um, we're starting to explore green button connect my data. Um, Michael's been part of those conversations, but but in terms of like looking forward, I mean, there's been um, legislation brought up to committee in DC that would, you know, put in place a DER authority that would actually be in charge of interconnection and metering and data and, and um, distribution system planning. And so just kind of wondering if there are examples of that. Thanks. Yeah, um, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, the UK, uh, what relatively little I know about it is the usage data itself goes to the, uh, the DCC, the acronym I'm blanking on it right now. Um, and that is deliberately not a retail supplier that owns it. And it's not the network, the utility, what we call the utility, they call the network that owns it. Um, it's actually another for-profit company that's separately regulated by Ofgem. Um, and so they chose not to have a public institution own it, um, perhaps because, you know, uh, they thought the private sector would be more innovative or something and could do it at a lower cost. Um, the DER legislation that your uh, bill that you're referring to um, would have put it squarely within the DC municipal government, but potentially they could have contracted it out, you know, to a, to a third party. Um, there's some really interesting ownership, uh, structure questions, like what, what's the best model? Um, you know, sometimes when I'm like really frustrated with investor owned stuff, I'm like, yeah, it should totally be public. And then other times when it's public and doesn't work so well, I'm like, man, we really need a profit motive here, you know? <laughs> so like, I'm personally conflicted about it. Um, uh, one thing I will say though, that, that has been, uh, helpful again, using, going back to sort of the academic research and the, the historical precedents in antitrust is something called yardstick competition. And whenever you have a monopoly in a certain area, um, one of the approaches to assure that you're not getting screwed by poor service and high prices is for the government to actually own and control a portion of that. And this was actually used successfully during World War I and World War II to prevent price gouging from uh, defense uh, contractors. And so, um, you know, things have only gotten worse in the present day, but, you know, at the time there's like, you know, one or two companies that would make like the tank treads or something. And the government was like, well, we're gonna own part of the tank tread supply chain to keep these guys honest, right? And so I think there's definitely some sort of role there um, manifested most recently with California and the community choice aggregators. So if we want to have uh, away from the bad news and towards the good news a little bit. Um, there is some really remarkable, very easy to use. Um, I know, Alex, you know about this, but I'm, I'm telling this for everyone else. Um, web portals for the CCAs in California, um, many of which were built by Utility API, who's a mission data member, and they do awesome work. And it's free to use. And there's a very simple process for exchanging energy data and it's just like, man, it's just dialed in and it works. And that is a great, excuse me, that is a great way for a public institution to sort of compete with the monopoly and say, oh, well, so you said 
that it was going to be really hard and it was going to be really expensive. Well, actually ours is working pretty darn well and it's not that expensive. And so there is a way of like sort of putting pressure um, on that in, in a productive sense. So maybe perhaps the answer is, to, is some sort of fusion of, of public and private, and they're both trying to outdo one another. And that way we can get the best outcome overall. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> there's a lot of discussion happening in the chat that I think is hard to just sort of combine. I, I haven't seen any of the chat, by the way. So you're just going to have to filter for me. Sure. I'm, I'm your, your spirit guide here. Um, <laughs> okay. um, so I'm going to maybe put someone on the spot <laughs> to come up with a question just because they had a lot of really good commentary. Um, Chris Villarreal, I, you said like a lot of really smart things in here. I can't summarize it into one thing. If you, we'd be so lucky, could you maybe jump up here and uh, maybe maybe um, you know get get some additional conversation going? Hey, Duncan, can you hear me? Yep. Um, to be honest, there's not a lot of more that I would have to add that Michael hasn't already talked about. I think um, you know my experience, which is on the regulatory side, so I, I've had to. Re either respond directly to things that Michael's filed or advise state commissions to respond to things that Michael filed. Um, a lot of the questions and issues that he's raised in my mind are stuff that I would largely agree with. Um, I guess what I would note is something that I think I ended up with on FERC order 2222 is that, um, you know, being involved in state commission proceedings, if, especially if they're not doing things that you want them to do is really important. And I know it's hard to get involved in state commissions. But I would also add that because of where we are with 2022 implementation, that being involved in the RTO discussions right now on 2222 is also a really important component for DER providers because the RTOs, in, in, and by this, I, I don't mean KISO because KISO is pretty much already done, but MISO, SVP, PJM, and New England ISO, they are still developing their rules for how DER providers are gonna participate. And importantly, in those conversations are the metering and telemetry requirements. And as an example, MISO just simply looked to what are the distribution utility metering and telemetry requirements. And that to me means that if they're just gonna rely on whatever the utilities say, that's a significantly lost opportunity for DER providers to go into RTOs and say, hey, wait a minute, we have metering and telemetry capabilities on our end through the EVSE or through um, the submeter that's already on the site or the advanced inverter or what have you. And we can provide the same or similar metering telemetry information to you. So you can just rely on our information. And that's a way that would allow the DR providers to um, be more proactive in how their sources of information can be responsive to the needs of the market. And I guess to make it a question and to make it a joke, Michael, would you agree? Uh, that's just a question. I don't know that that's a joke. No, but I, I would, I would, um, definitely. And, th and thank you, Chris, for, you know, uh, Chris has done a lot of great work in various states on this, um, after, uh, working on many of these sort of, you know, at the time, very novel data access rules in California. Um, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't default to whatever the utility says. That's just a bad, bad idea. Um, Issues about perceived fraud from device level metering equipment, those can totally be addressed. Um, it, you know, like think about it just like a portfolio. Like if you have, you know, if you're concerned about the meter readings on 3% of them, well, so what? So just like buy 3% more resource and even it out and so you're good. Like there are statistical approaches to looking at this. Um, that involve, you know, some extent of random sampling and whatever, that it's a solvable problem. Um, I think one of the, the challenges is that, you know, only the big guys have the, um, you know, have the time and resources to really participate in all of these different, different areas. So mission data is sort of designed to like take some of the pain and suffering away from startups on state level stuff. <laughs> and I sort of maybe, you know, maybe I should, you know, start a sister organization or something to work on, on the RTOs because there's just a ton of um, a ton of overlap and sometimes just a 
attending the meetings, like it sounds really simple, but like that makes a difference. You know, um, it's sad that a lot of these rules uh, happen and a lot of companies just can't afford to be there and just not in the room. And man, you get, you get eaten alive sometimes. Tell us how to make that happen. The sister organization, because that, that ties in with my earlier, uh, working at the RTO level. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's talk about it. Several, I have several different ideas, but, um, it's, I think there's a need for it. And the question is, do you work with <clears throat> existing organizations? Is there some new one? What's the funding model? All those things. Let's, let's talk about it. All right. Just maybe, maybe, maybe it should just be the DR task force. <laughs> we got a lot of smart people here already trying to try to change up the, how the markets work. So. Yeah. All right. I think we have one or two left to wrap up the end of this. Um, and hopefully those who asked are still here. Um, Matt Brown had a, from LO3 had a really interesting question, um, kind of about carrots and sticks. Um, Matt, if you're here, do you want to jump up? Yeah. Hey, Duncan. Hey, Michael. How are you? Hey, Matt. Um, yeah, I, you know, not specific. I'm just, you know, if you think about timeline from sort of a corporate perspective, a lot of these companies, you know, uh, probably aren't going to be around if the access issues are going to take years and years and years through courts and, and regulatory processes, which is not to say it's, 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 of course, a worthy endeavor for public policy purposes. So um, on that side, and then obviously from a climate mitigation perspective, every year matters. And so, um, you know, have you looked at other uh, either monetary or, or other ways to kind of get the utility to the table in ways that, you know, they could benefit, setting aside the, all of the realities that they don't need to benefit and they shouldn't, but like just for the sake of, of progress, um, other, other approaches. Yeah. Um, I think about this a lot. Um, I, I don't know that I have great answers, but um, there are some early indications uh, that a performance-based rate-making approach could be what we need to get the incentives in the right place. Um, the incentives don't always ensure great outcomes, but they would at least neutralize some of the outright hostility towards data accessibility that we see. Um, I understand that somewhat recently Hawaii um, has something related to um, uh, de uh, data access um, to, you know, DER developers as a, as an incentive that HECO can, you know, earn more money if they do a good job. Um, it's sort of on my reading list to go through that. I haven't read it yet. Um, but I think that's the type of model that at least starts to set things on the right track. Um, keep in mind, you do, you will have opposition from consumer advocates who, you know, somewhat justifiably will say, well, if we told them to do it, they should do it. Why do we need to bribe them to do it? Um, and those are important constituencies, right, within the PC ecosystem. So um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, the, the fallback is basically screen scraping. Um, and I think there is some productive tension there that we can use as well to say like, look, like if, you're, if you just want your websites to get hit with screen scrapers, great, then don't do anything. <laughs> Status quo, man. <laughs> right. But if we want to be like constructive here and have good policy, um, just like what the banks are struggling with right now, right? Um, then I think there, there should be some coming together where there is mutual benefit. But yeah, is it going to take some potentially some additional incentives? Are we going to maybe have to hold our noses a little bit at the, you know, ROE adders or something to get, that to get added on? Maybe, you know, maybe that's an important part of a political compromise. All right, I think we have time for like one more maybe. Um, and we just got a new one. Um, Addison Hebert um, 
as I think a pretty broad question, but it's a fun one and it gets us a little out of the weeds too. Addison, if, if you're still here, do you want to ask it? Uh, I am here. Yeah, totally. Uh, really cool discussion. I learned a lot through this. Um, I wanted to kind of ask a question and bring this to maybe like the foreground of before. Oh yeah, excuse me. So let me just jump into it. Um, how do you think these smart meters might be able to help leverage on like a residential homeowner scale, um, electrification, adoption of heat pumps and things like that, getting outside of conventional natural gas or oil uh, boilers. Um, so thinking before the fact of, you know, great, we can use these to monitor and improve, but how might third party companies or utility companies look at homeowners and say, look at this really cool tool, look what it can do. Just curious for your thoughts there. Yeah, great question. Um, a couple of things come to mind. One is the disaggregation capabilities could be used for really enhanced targeting. Um, cost of customer acquisition, particularly in residential is, as we all know, a major, major obstacle. Um, and so to the extent- What you mean by disaggregation for anyone who's not familiar? Yeah, um, so it's the, the idea of analyzing your whole home or whole building um, energy usage patterns at, at high detail, like thousands of times per second, and deriving, um, well, both identifying as well as quantifying what the component loads are based on certain signatures. So like the duration of a load, um, it's like, oh, that looks like an EV load because it came on for seven kilowatts and it lasted for six hours, you know, seems reasonable to conclude that's an EV, right? So there's, there's all sorts of machine learning that's really quite advanced on, on identifying these loads. Um, and you know, that I think, so that would be really helpful in just pruning the, the sales pipeline for like heat pump installs. Um, so you're just not wasting your time with, you know, unqualified folks. I think that's, that's going to be really valuable. Um, but the other thing aside from targeting is you could imagine sort of a, um, uh, just like, you know, that I think Tesla and Sunrun have, you know, different apps like you get a solar system and you have an app that shows you what's what. And then like, if you add more storage, oh, there's more features on the app, right? Or then you get an EV and oh, that's tied in too. And, and so like, it becomes like this launching off point as, as sort of customer interest and sophistication grows into other energy areas. And you could have totally imagined something like that, um, like sort of a energy analyst app assistant, if you will, that's, you know, communicating over the cloud, you know, via Wi-Fi. Um, helping customers with like no and low cost measures. And then they start to get a little, they're like, oh, this is cool. I'm saving a bunch of money or I'm getting clean power or what have you. I'm shutting off my load when the, gr the grid is really dirty. And then they can escalate to like, you know, I'm gonna see about a heat pump. And that entity will have some of that information to sort of take that customer up that curve, if you will. Um, so I think that's how it would be especially useful. Um, and that's just in the sales process. We haven't even talked about like, on the operations and maintenance side, once you've deployed a DER, you know, measuring it, make sure it, it, it works over time, that it's delivering maximum value, stuff like that. There's a, there's a ton of value on that side as well. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, we, ha we don't have any left, so I'm going to ask just one last one that maybe just kind of blows things up. It's, it's different. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about especially with regard to electrification of heat and EVs, we're gonna to need to build out the distribution grid more, right? Um, there's a lot of grid that has to get built and I don't even mean transmission, although we probably have to do that too. I just mean the local stuff because loads going to you know, go up in different ways we haven't experienced before in specific locations, et cetera. And a big part of the promise of DERs is not just energy, but also demand. And I guess by that, what I mean is if we use DER as well, we can reduce the extent to which we have to build up the grid, which would be great, right? Because distribution charges are gonna become a major constraint on the economics of electrification, right? So like Veter in New York attempts to do this, right? It has a compensation mechanism by which the owners of DERs can get credit for basically reducing the future cost of distribution infrastructure. And 
if you look at kind of how this is done, they basically give you like specific areas. If you're in this part of Williamsburg, you can get that credit. If you're in this area, you can get that credit. How that was determined, I mean, I'm sure it was a somewhat public process, but it's like pretty opaque by the time it matters. And all this discussion of data makes me think about not just any individual customer's data, but if there's any discussion about distribution grid data, um, and if people, maybe all of the people, should have access to it, if we should know precisely what feeders, buses, and substations are constrained and how much, um, so that we can you know, sort of target our, our DERs most effectively. And part of that's about compensation, which I think is a different discussion. But like, is there discussion about this at all? And I, I guess if everybody's user data was sort of free and accessible, we could, we could build this map ourselves. <laughs> it might be hard, but you know what I'm saying here? Like an actual operational map of the distribution grid. We know this at the ISO level and down to certain nodes, I guess. It, is this like even part of the discussion? Um, what's happening on the distribution grid and that data access? Yeah, it, it is, um, but it's, it's sort of a different, um, it's in a different lane than the one that I am working on. Um, you know, a lot of these issues, I think began around the 2014, 2015 timeframe on uh, distributed resource planning in California. Um, all of those debates have been happening there. Um, uh, you know, all sorts of reasons get thrown out for why, you know, the utilities black box shall never be opened, you know, cybersecurity reasons, you know, terrorism reasons, um, you name it, right? <laughs> um, I, uh, there's sort of a multi-stage process, I think, um, just as, an, as a bit of an outside observer to that type of debate. Um, I think targeting is sort of the first one, like you don't need to to have an open source, your entire black box to just know like, where's there more value to providing DERs at different times, right? Like that's, that should be fairly obvious. And there's some submission data members that are working on, uh, on that, like the whole like kind of DER marketplace idea that Recurve um, is doing. That's really interesting um, where you don't need to get into the guts of distribution resource planning in order to just know where is it valuable and where should we target? Um, that's sort of step one. I think as you get high, to higher and higher levels, like eventually, I don't know what the intermediate stages are, but eventually you get to a DSO. And um, it's probably, you know, politically, um, you can't just do that quantum leap and just get to DSO. <laughs> you know, there's going to be a lot of intermediate stages um, and there's probably lots of other people much more qualified than I to... Um, to talk about that. Um, I said it, it, towards the very beginning that, you know, mission data has historically focused on permission-based exchanges. Um, and I do think that offers us a, um, we have the benefit of a certain, um, you know, clarity, um, like from an ethics perspective, that like, we're not asking for people's information who didn't consent to it. Um, and that issue does start to come up when you talk about feeder loading characteristics, right? Where there's like 10 or 15 customers, like is 15, is that okay? Like, can I share nine? That's not okay. Like where, where's the line under what circumstances, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of those conversations are starting to happen on like a, from a privacy perspective. Um, but I think, you know, there's more and more utility, resistance to having a, 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 you know, camel's nose under the tent in that arena. Um, so I, it's something that I'm like, I'm sympathetic to a lot of those battles and that information asymmetry that does exist. Um, if we want a cheaper decarbonization for everyone on the grid, um, we're going to have to get really good at targeting and this is going to have to like, we're going to need DERs everywhere. Um, otherwise people are going to hate us for doing the energy transition and the costs are going to be too damn high. And we've just set ourselves back big time. So, um, I'm, I don't quite know what the answer is, but I think there's, um, there's ways of getting a lot of the value without having to force the entire distribution planning and operations, you know, mathematics and profession, having that be, you know, open source and under, you know, public scrutiny. 
Yeah. You know, and in the chat, Lauren Trisberg brings up like the flip side of this. You know, one side is where should we cite things to generate value? The other side is where are we allowed to cite things and hosting capacity maps, right? Which are super contentious. And like a lot of times I go on these maps and it's like red, green, or yellow. <laughs> and it's like, well, I'd actually really love to see even just an 8760 of, of this red, green, and that yellow section, because maybe I could just prevent my system from exporting during the bad times, right? So like, there's, it's not just a value thing. It's also like, I'm being forced to pay for grid upgrades, um, perhaps for my DER system because of red, green, yellow on the hosting capacity map. When in reality, like I very much could prevent that from being a problem if I had data. Um, so there, there's another side to it too that I think is interesting that does suppress DER installation. Yeah, and there's and there's some great people working on that issue more directly in California, um, like International Renewable Energy Council and folks like that. Cool. All right. Well, I made the call for any last questions, and I did not get. I don't see any question marks. Um, um, yeah, and we're also two minutes over the deadline we promised you. So I think we're going to call it. Um, thank you so much for joining us. This was awesome. This was super fun. I think. Thank you. Um, you know, maybe we should follow up with everybody in the DER task force about how they could get involved with mission data. Um, you know, what they can do to help. So maybe offline, you and I can talk about that a bit, and then in our next newsletter and in the Slack and stuff, we can we can get the word out. Um, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you all so much. It's uh, it's really a pleasure. You know, feel free to email me. Uh, it's on our website, missiondata.io. It's just michael at missiondata.io. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining. We'll, uh, All right. we'll see you next month. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you.